you could start with your welcome address to the team thank you so much uh, dr saab and my colleagues uh, really it's indeed a great evening great evening doctors uh, this is sayed ansari i am the sales head for south and west magna sar division uh, we are very much excited to have you to join us and i welcome each one of you individually for this great evening uh, with dr jamsud jalal that's all uh, thank you so much over to mr harshad Good afternoon, Dr. Jamshed Dalal. And first of all, I would like to, uh, would like to start with uh, thank you so much for accepting our invitation for being a speaker on this particular meeting, sir. Uh, so to the audience, all those people who are uh, you know viewing us live, though Dr. Dalal does not uh, need any kind of introduction, uh, would like to formally welcome him and would like to read his CV slides. So allow me a second. I would read his CV slides. <coughs> As I said, Dr. Jamshed Dalal is a renowned cardiologist of India, and he does not require any kind of introduction. But still, as I said, formally, I would like to welcome him. So, uh, Dr. Dalal has performed 3,000 cardiac arrest procedure. So, it says that how much experienced he is in this, this particular field. It is first coronary angiography in the UK in 1978, and after that, he has done more than 20,000 cases in more than 40 years. He has been involved in in many many coronary angioplasty programs since the invent, uh, invention of this particular angioplasty procedure. and he is involved in techni teaching the procedure to the doctors in india and china over the last 20 years he remained the coordinator of the cardiovascular division and guided the specialty to international levels he has been part of the many national and international conferences as a speaker and as a uh, editor in the many many journals so that's all from my side for dr uh, dalal so uh, dr jabshed dalal once again i would like to thank you so much to you and this virtual play, uh, podium is uh, all yours now sir. Thank you very much. Uh, allow me. Over to, to you, Dr. Dalal. Thank you. So, friends, uh, over the next thirty uh, minutes or so, I am going to cover the importance of lipid lowering, uh, especially in high-risk cardiovascular disease cases. and multiple atherosclerotic vascular disease problems i am also going to emphasize today predominantly on bempedoic acid because i think bempedoic acid is a new entrant into the market of lipid lowering therapy and let us see how it stands today and how we are going to manage the use of this drug along with all the other drugs which we have for lipid lowering now we all know that lowering ldl is the most important aspect of prevention of coronary disease or not only coronary disease but cardiovascular disease so whenever we talk of the benefits of lipid lowering we often talk about coronaries predominantly because we are cardiologist but is equally important for cerebrovascular disease stroke renal disease peripheral artery disease so it's not just coronary which is benefited but every single vascular tree in the body so looking first at the coronary events you can see a 23% reduction of major events as you go down the line in terms of reduction of ldl and if you look at reduction of all major vascular events again a very dramatic similar 20 plus percent reduction so the absolute reduction of ldl cholesterol is the primary predictor of the risk reduction so all you need to do is to reduce your ldl as low as possible and i'll tell you about what the present guidelines suggest so yes we can talk about pleiotropic effects we can talk about many other aspects of lipid profile i'm not going to go into that i'm not going to discuss discuss about triglycerides or lipoprotein a i'm going to restrict myself to the effect on uh, ldl because i think we all agree that that is the most important now we've had statins with us for many decades but we all know that in spite of use of statins in the many trials these are some trials there are many many trials which shows that there's always a residual risk involved because with with statins we can never always achieve the ldl goals and there are many other issues associated with it as well so that there's always a problem of statin therapy alone then also there's a very big problem of uh, adherence a simple study here if you're looking at adherence fully adherent patients this is after a myocardial infarction so you already had an acute mi life threatening event and yet less than half of the audience uh, less than half of the patients uh, are taking uh, statins in full dose partial adherence is 31% 
and 26%. That is almost one in four of your patients, even after a myocardial infarction, six months later, stop your therapy. So this is a very important problem in terms of lipid lowering, uh, as we know. Now, let us look at what the present guidelines say. So if you look at the latest guidelines, which is the 2019, and if you look at the 2016, most guidelines are now divided into low-risk patients, moderate-risk patients, high-risk and very high-risk. So low-risk patients are the ones which are absolutely primary uh, patients with no problems whatsoever, no risk factors. And even then, they suggest that your LDL be should below 115. So no longer the old criteria of 150 or 190 LDL is acceptable. Even for the most basic primary prevention, it should be 150. In my opinion, a very simple thing as far as Indians are concerned is to keep the LDL below 100. Because Indians are very prone to diabetes, very prone to hypertension and very prone to ischemic heart disease. If you want to remember a single value, in these patients with no risk factors, very low in the risk for cardiovascular disease, keep it below 100. If it's, of course, moderate risk, they suggest 100. And once you go to high risk, it is below 70 and very high risk below 55. This is not only 55, but it is 55 and 50% 50 reduction. In 2016, they said 70 or 50% reduction. And now in 2019, they're saying 55, less than 55 and 50%. So if a person has a myocardial infarction and has an LDL of 80, you must reduce the blood LDL to 40 because it must be a 50% reduction. For a patient whose LDL is 100, you can reduce it to 50. So clearly, important point, less than 55 for these very high-risk patients and, and a 50% reduction of the LDL cholesterol. So please remember, it is both the percentage and the absolute value. If you look at the Indian guidelines, the Lipid Association of Indian guidelines, very recent, which was published by us in 2020. If you look again at the low-risk group, when should the treatment be started? When the LDL is below 100. When should moderate risk again 100? Any patient with a high risk, less than 70. Very high risk, 50. And in fact, in the extreme high risk group, the Lipid Association suggests that you may bring your cholesterol down to less than 130. You can also look at non-HDL cholesterol, which is also an important aspect to look at besides the LDL cholesterol. And that also should be kept at 60 below or at below 80. But if we concentrate on LDL, as you remember, ESC said 55. LDS is 50, and in the extreme high-risk category, even less than 30. And this is a sort of chart that has been drawn. So you have a patient who's got a very high-risk situation. You start them on high-intensity statins, and then in the very extreme high-risk group, you add ezetimibe, and then, of course, category A, category B, and try and reduce it down to 30 uh, uh, as the LDL goal. So definitely below 30, better still if you get it below 30. Pepinoic acid doesn't come out here because when these guidelines were formed, pepinoic acid was not available. And then they went even further, ESC. ESC also came down, like the lipid association. We have said LDL below 40, but lipid, the ESC is also suggested that in this very high-risk group, class 2B indication, get it below 40. So when you're talking of high-risk, very high-risk, what do we actually mean? So if you look at the very high-risk group, what is very high-risk group? Any form of coronary artery, any form of vascular disease, either CAD, PAD or stroke or a homozygous or heterozygous hypercholesterolemia, diabetes with three major risk factors. Again, risk factors target organ damage. And those, if you look at the more extreme group, let's say that this is the most extreme group, this will be coronary artery disease plus diabetes or polyvascular. That means somebody who's got a heart disease plus stroke or heart disease plus peripheral vascular disease target organ damage with uh, diabetes or familial hypercholesterol. So these are not very unusual patients. Most cardiologists in day-to-day -day practice, mostly their patients will be in this risk group. They'll be very high risk or extreme high risk. So please remember that a person who's had an angioplasty and diabetes falls into the very high risk group. Now, of course, we are scared of bringing LDL down too much. So the question is, is it safe to bring LDL down too much? That's a very uh, legitimate question. This is a very interesting slide which came after the PCSK9 inhibitors brought into work because they are the only ones who can reduce the LDLs down to 20. So here you can see neurocognitive, liver, muscle, non-cardiovascular death and hemorrhagic stroke. And red to purple 
red to purple, you can see over 100 milligrams LDL to less than 20. And what do you see here? That when you have a patient whose LDL is more than 100 and you bring it down to even less than 20, we are not talking about 50, less than 20, there is no harm whatsoever in any of the parameters. So clearly there is no safety concern even with an LDL as low as 20. So I think that is now well established. And the reason, of course, is many people say that cells require cholesterol. Yes, they require cholesterol, but they're very capable of forming. For example, the brain is very capable of forming its own concentration of LDL. So therefore, it doesn't require serum LDL in order to function. In fact, the blood-brain barrier does not allow LDL to cross from the blood into the brain. So where is the question of LDL value affecting brain? So all this talk about memory and brain problems is completely false. When does the brain really uh, develop in childhood? And what is the LDL level of small children and babies? 30. So clearly you don't need high LDL for your brains to develop. Again, another pointing factor is that these people are born with PCSK9 deficiency. Just two examples here. They are born with an LDL of 14 and 15. And look at them. Years later, 30, 40 years later, good health, children, normal fertility, no problems whatsoever. So clearly low LDL does not seem to have any harmful effects as well. So how do you get the LDL down? I think statins, of course, remain the number one drug. So let us not believe that any drug is going to replace statins. So statins will remain number one. But what other drugs do you have? You have azetamide, which was shown in the IMPROVE-IT trial. Significant benefit of adding azetamide to statins. Then you had the Fourier trial, which was PCSK9 Evolucumab. Significant benefit when you added PCSK9 to statins. And then you had the Odessi trial, which is another PCSK9 called Alurucumab. Again, significant benefit when added to statins. So you clearly have PCSK9 inhibitors and you have azetamide as your therapy, which is already available to us till bepinoic acid came into vogue. <clears throat> so predominantly, most people would start with statins. Try and use the high-intensity statins, which is usually 20 or 40 milligrams of rosua statin and 40 or 80 milligrams of atorva statin. We don't use semvastatin, bravastatin, because these are all weak and not used and they have their own issues. And then, of course, we used to say combine the two, statins and azetamide, if goals are not reached, PCSK9 inhibitors. But now we have this new drug, bepinoic acid, which I will tell you about, which can be combined with azetamide, with statins, and if necessary, with PCSK9 as well. So great new advantage of having this drug. Now, what are the limitations of current therapy? There'll be about 30-40% who will still not achieve goals in spite of your statins and azetamide. Also, very extreme high-risk group, as I mentioned, need additional lowering. So you give both your drugs, statins and azetamide, but still your LDL does not reach the goal. 50% of patients stop statins. Statins have a very bad reputation, as you know. In public, it has a very bad reputation. People keep stopping statins. And again, there's a development of early onset diabetes. So that's another worry with statin. Fibrates, they're not so effective for statins, much more for triglycerides. PCSK9 are extremely effective. They can reduce your LDL down to 20, but they're very expensive. Injectable at about 18,000 per injection to be given twice a month. Really, it's a big expense. Azetamide doesn't reduce the LDL so much, but it's a good drug. Uh, in terms of partial reduction of LDL, and this is what we have been using in the present time, statins plus azetamide. It reduces LDL cholesterol by about 10 to 15 milligrams. It also reduces HSCRP, just like statin does. So if you look at the actions of various drugs, you got statins, as you know out here, which affects the conversion of acetyl coenzyme to cholesterol. Bepinoic acid acts one step ahead at this particular level. So bepinoic acid acts at the initial stage, Statins act at a later stage. Azetamide acts in the stomach, so completely different mode of action, prevents absorption of fats in the intestine. Inclucidin acts at the level of the mRNA PCSK9, and PCSK9 inhibitors acts by inhibiting PCSK9. Inclucidin is the recent one. The advantage is that it is an injectable like PCSK9, but it has to be given twice in a year. PCSK9 is given twice a month. This is an mRNA-based produces inhibition of PCSK9 formation. PCSK9 inhibitors, PCSK9 inhibitors actually inhibit the PCSK9. So we are talking about bepinoic acid, and let me tell you a little bit more about this. So here I have mentioned to you, this is where statins act. HMCOG, 
HMGCOA conversion to cholesterol, this is where statins will act. This is where bepinoic acid will act. So it acts at the earlier part of the, uh, of the cycle. And the other advantage is that it doesn't act on the muscles. So statins act on the muscles as well. And therefore, you get muscle aches and pains. This enzymatic uh, coenzyme is not present in the muscle. And therefore, this is a, like a statin exactly in terms of its mechanism, but it does not produce muscle. So it's a clear benefit in terms of less side effects. So though there are receptors, uh, same receptors are utilized by statins and pepinoic acid. Uh, but if you look at pepinoic acid, it does not interfere with the uptake of statins. And pepinoic acid is very liver specific and it does not have muscle related adverse effects. So big advantage of pepinoic acid uh, over statins. Now a number of trials have been carried out with pepinoic acid. I'm going to concentrate on pepinoic acid. And they produced a series of things called CLEAR. Cholesterol lowering via bepinoic acid ACL inhibition regime called CLEAR. And then various tests, uh, studies, harmony, wisdom, serenity, tranquility, and CLEAR outcomes. So if you look at here, you get a better picture. In CLEAR serenity and CLEAR tranquility, there's hardly any statin use. So this was predominantly monotherapy. Most of these patients, as you can see, have diabetes, hypertension, here also diabetes, hypertension. And then you talk about the CLEAR harmony, and clear wisdom. These were patients on maximally tolerated background of statins. So very important. These two had no statins. These two have maximally tolerated. Again, you can see diabetes, hypertension, again, 60-70%. Again, hypertension, heart failure, diabetes. So group of patients are same. These were not on statins. These were on statins. So if we look at the treatment in, let's say, this group, clear harmony and clear wisdom. So this was maximally tolerated statins. These were not on statins. So if you're not on statins, you get very dramatic reductions of your LDL cholesterol. So the mean LDL cholesterol went down 23%. This went down again in the clear Senate, 23%. When the patient was already on statin, obviously the statins had already lowered the uh, lipid quite down, the LDL, but you got an additional benefit of 16 and 15%. So you can see that if your patient's not on statins, of course, a much greater reduction with bepinoic acid monotherapy. And if your patient is on statin, then again, a significant further benefit. I would like to make it clear out here that I do not think that we should replace statins with bepinoic acid. It's not correct. I think statins have various effects which are pleiotropic. Statins have been available with us for almost two or three decades. We have a huge volume of patients on, on statins. Bepinoic acid, on the other hand, is a recent drug. We don't have that much data. We're going to use it for the first time in our country. So we have to see how Indians respond to it. And of course, we look forward to many more trials. So let's be very clear between the difference between the two. If we look at HRCRP, which we know is an inflammatory response marker, and we know that reduction of inflammation is very important. And again, if we look at the same trials, clear harmony, clear wisdom in maximally tolerated statin dose and tranquility and serenity in those not on statins. And you can see again, much more reduction of HRCP when patient is not on statins. And of course, when HRC is already reduced by statins, you get a further reduction uh, of HRCP. So clearly, this drug, like a statin, produces reduction of LDL and a reduction of HSCRP. And when you add it on top of statin, you get a further reduction of LDL and a further reduction of HSCRP. Now, again, to give a little more background breakup, this is the clear wisdom trial. This is patients already on statin intensity, background intensity, so they're already on statins. And if we look at all patients, 15% reduction, not on statins, 24% reduction. Patients on low dose statins, 14% reduction. Patient on high dose statins, 14%. So clearly, if you're on even high dose statins, it can still produce a benefit. So clearly, it's important to remember that even if you're on a high dose statin, it is worthwhile giving bepidoic acid. If you look at other parameters, this LDL we have discussed earlier, <clears throat> total cholesterol, of course, is reduced. ApoB, which is the bad B, is the bad apoprotein, it's reduced. If you look at non-HDL cholesterol, is also very important, again, reduced by 11%. So looking at components also, you can see the benefit. Another study looking at various parameters, non-HDL reduction by 13%, triglycerides reduction by 11%, and ApoB. So again, Please remember triglycerides, I'm sorry, this is total cholesterol, beg your pardon, total cholesterol. So again, non-HDL cholesterol 
total cholesterol and ApoB. Triglyceride effect is not that intense with bepinoic acid. And again, if you look at HSCP in the wisdom trial, you can see an 18.7% reduction overall in with the use of bepinoic acid as early as 12 weeks. Let us look at the duration of action of the drug. So if you look at LDL cholesterol at 12 weeks, at for 24 weeks and 52 weeks, so this is 12 weeks, 24 weeks and 52 weeks in all the four trials. And again, you can see that there's a very dramatic reduction of LDL and then some stabilization to marginally less levels, again, not significantly. So clearly the effect of this is maintained over a long period of time. So there's no tolerance which develops to bempedoic acid. Again, if you look at another trial, the tranquility part of the study, again, looking at various parameters, you can see LDL cholesterol. These are statin intolerant patients, so they are only on ezetimide or very small doses of statins. You can see LDL very dramatic reduction, 28%, non-HDL 18%, total cholesterol 15%, ApoB 14%, and HRCP more than 30%. So again, if you look at breakdown in these different trials, they all show the same. So again, this size really summarizes everything. You get a 26% reduction of LDL cholesterol, non-HDL goes down, ApoB goes down, CRP goes down, and of course, CV protection goes up. So of course, are there any side effects? There have been nothing dramatic in terms of side effects. What we have seen is that there is some hyperuricemia. There is gout. So I think patients who have hyperuricemia and gout, do be careful. If patients in acute gout, I don't think that would be the right time to start the patient. So clearly, this is one issue that has come up. Liver problems, no. There's some evidence of tendon rupture that has been spoken about, but really nothing further has come about this, and we need to watch it a little bit longer. More important, there is no worsening of diabetes like statins. So good beneficial effect in terms of no diabetic worsening, some problems related to hyperuricemia and gout. So if you look at the precautions while using bempedoic acid, no concerns if there is renal impairment or hepatic impairment, except of course end-stage uh, hepatic failure, you'll always be careful. And monitor these patients wherever, of course, uric acid is high. Be very careful when the patient has gout or if the patient is taking corticosteroids, fluorocones and other things, renal failure, history of tendon rupture, then do monitor them. Discontinue the drug, of course, when patient is pregnant, breastfeeding, avoid use of semvastatin and prevastatin along with bempedoic acid because it will interfere in the hepatic pathway. Another very good combination, according to me, is bempedoic acid plus azetamide. And this is particularly so in patients who do not want to or cannot tolerate statins. So there are patients who just refuse to take statins or make so much noise about statins, even though my personal experience is that the absolute intolerance to statins is very, very small. There's what they call the nocebo effect, which means you patients know they're going to get muscle pain, so they all start getting aches and pains. And it's very surprising when you see a 60-year-old person who anyway is having all sorts of aches and pains, but blames everything on the statins. I've seen patients who require knee replacement, but blame the pain of the knee on statin. So clearly be very careful. I think a little communication, explanation to the patient is beneficial. Some people tell the patient that, yes, you're getting muscle pain. That's a good sign. It means your, your act, drug is acting and you'll get benefit of the drug. I also tell them that it's better to get pain in the leg than pain in the chest. So I think we need to convince the patient one way or the other that they need to do. But when you have statin intolerant patients, or so those who only want to take a very small dose, 5 milligrams, I think the combination of bempedoic acid and azetamide is an extremely good combination. And here is a study looking at that. This is azetamide, lowering your LDL cholesterol percentage, bempedoic acid, lowering it. But when you combine the two, see what a significant 36% reduction in terms of LDL. Look at HR, HSCRP again here. Again, very dramatic reduction. Ezetimide doesn't produce much reduction of HRCRP. Pempedoic acid much more and combination much more. So you can see out there that the combination of this drug, dramatic reduction of LDL along with dramatic reduction of HRCP. So I think this is a very good drug combination and I'm sure that we'll be seeing it soon. Again, drug is called bempedoic acid. Uh, dose is usually 180 milligrams single daily, once a day with or without food. So that's what is going to be. Single tablet, single dose, no variations of dose with or without food. FDA and EU have already approved it. FDA has approved indication as an adjunct to diet and maximally tolerated statin therapy. 
administer 180 milligrams orally once a day with or without food. European Union has also approved it in patients with adult hypercholesterolemia. They are talking more and cholesterol, familial hypercholesterolemia, but it's used beyond that even other patients and same dose 180 milligrams once a day. Again, there are some studies which are going to come out, the clear outcome studies, we'll have the data sometime later, so we need more studies to come out. And in fact, in the uh, recent uh, uh, society presentation, you are going to see a lot of these uh, drugs coming out in the future. I mean, a lot of these studies coming out in the future. So in conclusion, bempedoic acid is a novel lipid lowering drug with unique mechanism of action. It reduces LDL cholesterol in a variety of situations both patients with familial hypercholesterolemia and patients with cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes. It also reduces HSCRP and it's a very effective drug as an additive drug, both with statins and azitamide. So this is what I feel its uses as a monotherapy in statin intolerant patients. So if nothing patient is willing to take, give peptidoic acid, you'll get a significant reduction in terms of uh, the LDL cholesterol. We know that we don't have any event studies yet. That means we don't have studies looking at cardiovascular mortality and things like that. They're in the pipeline, but we know that lowering LDL will help and therefore there's no reason why peptidoic acid lowering of LDL would be beneficial. It can be used along, as I mentioned, with small dose of statins for patients who do not tolerate large doses. It can be given along with full maximum dose. That means with 40 or 80, 40 of rosuva statin, 80 of atrost, and you can combine it with peptidoic acid to reach your goals. Suppose you want to get below 50 and the patient's LDL is 60 on acetamide and statins, you can add uh, pependoic acid and it'll bring it below 50. You'll achieve your goal. It can be used along with acetamide without statin. And of course, combination with acetamide and statin, I've already mentioned. But what is the main problem? The main problem is that patients don't take the drug. So we can talk as much as we want. We can discuss all this as much as we want. But the problem is that the patient do not take the drugs. So then if you don't take the drugs, you're not going to get any effect. And that is up to us to convince the patient to take the drugs. But this is a very eye-opener. This was a study called the Da Vinci study. It's the largest observational study on lipids presented in ESC 2020 and published uh, recently. Uh, uh, and the main thing that the study showed is that the majority of patients receive only moderate intensity. You can see on the upper graph on the left side, moderate intensity statins, high intensity, and you can see how many of them, 52% moderate, high intensity, 28, with combination of azetamide, 9. Of course, bepinoic acid was not available at that time. Persons who achieved the 2019 goal, only 33%. And who can we blame for that? We can't just blame patients. It's doctors who are responsible as well. We don't give the patients adequate dose. We don't give patients combinations and we don't have communication with the patient enough to convince the patient. Patient comes to us, say patients on 20 milligrams of a statin, comes to us and says, oh, I'm getting pain. Immediately, you reduce it down to 10. Patient says, my LDL was 70, now it's 60. Immediately lower down the statin. So doctors are very much at fault for reducing the statins or not immediately communicating the importance. I think doctors and patients both must realize the significant improvement and benefit of low LDL cholesterol. I think it's important to us to convince a patient that the lower the LDL, and we are talking as low as 20 and 30, is going to be even more beneficial. Please remember, we are not talking of primary prevention. We are not talking of these goals for just mild disease. We are talking of these goals for high-risk patient. A high-risk patient, for example, is a patient who on CT scan has more than 50% lesion in two arteries. That's a high-risk patient. A patient who's already had this myocardial infarction, already had an angioplasty or bypass surgery is a very high risk patient. A patient who has got coronary artery disease and peripheral vascular disease or stroke, very, very high risk patient or extreme high risk patient. Patient with diabetes for more than 10 years, patient with diabetes and three organs involved, patients with diabetes and CKD, patients with CKD and coronary artery disease, all these patients which are so common, they're extreme high risk and very high risk group of patients. Please remember that. And LDL in all these patients, you should try and get at least below 50. So I think we should now stop talking about high-intensity statin therapy and talk about high-intensity lipid therapy. Why? Because statin is only one drug. We got statin, we got azetamide, we got bempedoic acid now, we got PCSK9 inhibitors, and we got inclusiran. 
So why talk of high intensity statins? Yes, it's important, high intensity, but let's talk about high intensity lipid therapy. Nobody talks of high important, high intensity telmisartan for blood pressure. We all talk about combination, telmisartan plus diuretic plus calcium channel blocker. So similarly in the situation, it should be high intensity lipid lowering, statins, maximum dose tolerated, azitamide, pepidoic acid, and if even in spite of that it doesn't work, then of course PCSK9 inhibitors. So you must talk of high intensity lipid therapy, must talk of LDL years. The longer the patient has low LDL, the better for the patient in the future. So start the treatment early, intensify your treatment and use combined drugs. So therefore, let me point out to you that treating lip dyslipidemia is not meant to be easy. So don't think you put a little statin and your job is done. You have to encourage patients to think about LDL as being as important and matching the LDL target to the level of risk. Describe what is scientifically right. Show them the data, show them the study. And we, show, we have the tools to do it now and be very foolish for us not to use these tools. For those who are interested, you can read Eugene Brownwall. You all know Eugene Brownwall, father of cardiology. He's written a very nice article called Race to the Bottom. And this is one race where we should all run to the bottom. This is one race where we should be at the bottom, bottom of the LDL, LDL at 20 or 30. So I think that should be a goal. And I hope that I've convinced you all on the importance of this. So thank you very much indeed. And now we are open for any question answers that you may have. We have a good half an hour left uh, for that. Thank you so much, Dr. Dalal. There are a large number of questions on the chat box for, from about, say, 350 doctors who are online from across the country. Right, listening to your in my chat, please, Sanjay. Not I will read out some of these questions. There is something which I put on your chat as well. Yeah, no, you put it on my WhatsApp. Put it on my chat. So, Dr. Atul from Bilai Nagar, he's trying to understand, compared to statins, what are the chances of bampadoic acid causing rise in serum creatinine and causing diabetes? As we see from the study I showed you, the chance of getting diabetes is much less with bampadoic acid. The studies did not show any rise of diabetes, while well, statins do produce an early onset diabetes rise. So that is one aspect. However, having said that, let it be very clear that the rise of diabetes with statins is no reason or no indication not to use statins. In fact, you must continue statins because in the long run, they will do much better. So statin sugar rise is not an indication for stopping statins. Bempedoic acid has the advantage that it doesn't produce rise of, urine, of uh, sugar. None of these drugs affect kidneys, so there's no question of any statin or this drug affecting the kidney. There is some data suggesting that Rosuva statin produces increased proteinuria, but this increased proteinuria is tubular proteinuria and not glomerular proteinuria, and therefore does not damage the kidney. So none of the statins and neither does bempedoic acid damage the kidney. Thanks, doctor. The doc next question is from Dr. Anwar from Mumbai. He's asking if bampedoic acid is reducing LDLs, why is there is a need to add it on a statin? Because statins themselves also reduce LDL levels. Well, as you saw from my slides, we want LDL to be as low as possible. We also know that statins have been, as I mentioned to you earlier, this is my concern and I would like to share the concern. I don't think that you all should all start stop using statins and start using bepidoic acid. That would be very unfair to your patients. Number one, statins have been there for three, four decades. We have a huge population of patients with statins. We have a huge number of trials of statins. We have statins with outcome trials. None of this is there with bepidoic acid. Bepidoic acid is a recent drug. There are no outcome studies. We know it reduces LDL, so it's very good. So statins should be your first line drug of choice. Yes, bepindoic acid also reduces, but statins will overall reduce uh, lipids, LDL more than bepindoic acid. But now suppose you give statins and your LDL doesn't reach the goal. That's the whole question. If you put the patient on say 10 milligrams of Rosua statin and LDL is 30, then you don't need to do anything more. As simple as that. But if you put the patient on 10 milligrams of statins and the LDL is 100, he's a very high risk patient. You want it below 45. It comes to 100 with 20 milligrams of Rosua statin or even 40 milligrams. Increasing statin from 20 to 40 doesn't produce significant reduction of LDL, just maybe 5%. So then you add azitamide or bepindoic acid. We didn't have bepindoic acid, we used to add azitamide. You can add one or the other or both. Your aim should be to try and combine the drugs to get the LDL down to goal levels. So very, very high risk patients go up to 30 as per LAI. This you will not achieve with statins alone. Only combinations will bring it down. 
And that is why we have to use PCSK9 inhibitors in a large number of these patients. So many of these very high risk patients of mine, and I've got almost many dozens of patients on PCSK9, and they have very good achievement of LDL. When you use PCSK9, usually it is given along with statins, not just alone. We have no data on PCSK9 with pepinoic acid, but yes, clearly I see no reason why you cannot combine. But again, PCSK9 being very effective, you'll be able to achieve LDL levels of 20 or 30 without giving too many combination of drugs. Thank you, sir. One of the questions from a doctor is that my patients report muscle weakness sometimes with the statins. Would that deteriorate if I add pampidoic acid in such patients? No, it will not deteriorate because pampidoic acid doesn't act in the muscle level at all. It only acts at the hepatic pathway. So it will not increase or worsen your muscle symptoms. Also, when patient complains of muscle pain and muscle weakness, please look at it carefully. It is very, very rare to get any serious muscle problem like rhabdomyolysis or myositis. You can check the CPK of the patient. You'll find that in majority of patients, it will be completely normal. These patients have been brainwashed, if I may use the word, by various people, media, and all sorts of lay people that it produces a lot of muscle damage, kidney damage, liver damage, etc. It does not do anything. Any good cardiologist who communicates with this patient will be able to keep 95% of their patients on statins uh, and good doses. Yes, five patients of patients may be genuinely intolerant. If they're intolerant, you can reduce the dose. You can shift from, say, Rosuva to Atorva, Atorva to Rosuva. You can shift them over. You can reduce the dose. You can give a gap. You can give them alternate day. You can give them once or twice a week. So whichever way you do, try not to stop statins 100%. So I'll be quite happy if you give 5 milligrams twice a week. That's fine. But give at least some dose of statins. Then you add the pepinoic acid. LDL is still not there. You can combine with azetamide and give all three. Thanks, sir. The next question is from a doctor. He says that he saw some of the slides mentioning about 12 or 24 weeks of study. Considering that this is a long-term chronic therapy, are there any long-term studies available with the product? Well, please remember the first statement I made and the statement I made during questions. Please do not replace pepinoic acid by st from statins by pepinoic acid. Because statins, as I mentioned, have got decades of study. Pepinoic acid does not have these long studies. So, yes, you are absolutely correct. We do not have long-term studies with it. And we have to understand that. So, therefore, clearly it has got a role. It's a new drug. You can look at it the same way. SGLT2, ARNI, whatever drugs we use, they have a shorter outcome. Yes, Arnie's got now five years. SGLT is also coming, I think, three or four years. Pepinoic acid is now. So, yes, lose it. Use it carefully. Look at side effects. Watch uric acid. Watch for gout. Watch your patients closely. If you find that there is an issue, stop. Studies are in progress. By the end of this year, more so by next year, all these studies will be presented and you will get more data. Suppose some study shows that there is a major problem, the drug may be withdrawn. Suppose the study shows beautiful effect with no side effects, the drug will become more popular. So you are absolutely right. Studies are limited. Thanks, doctor. The next question is, the doctor wants to know that typically when I'm using statins, I add for triglycerides management fibrates. Why do you think there is a necessity to add a product like bampedoic acid? Well, triglycerides, you are, add, you are adding fibrates for triglycerides. Pempitoic acid does not have significant effect on triglycerides. So you are looking now at triglycerides for which you are giving statins and triglycerides phenofibrit, which is very good. So you got your phenofibrit below, well, you got your triglycerides below 150. So that's fine. So that part is covered. What about your LDL? You added your fib fibrates, you're going statins, but what is the LDL? Your phenofibrate may be 50, but your LDL is 110 and your patient has got multiple problems, stroke and myocardial infarction, bypass surgery done. You want the LDL down. So then you have to add bepinoic acid. If your triglycerides are controlled with fibrates and statins and your LDL is below 50, you don't need to add bepinoic acid. So look at the LDL value and treat that. Look at the triglyceride value and treat that with fibrates. The triglyceride value and treatment has got nothing to do with the LDL value and treatment. Thanks, doctor. One of the questions from a doctor is that typically, sir, in my practice, I use mid-dosage statins. Does it mean there is no role for bampedoic acid to be added in such patients? Again, first of all, question one, why are you using mid-dose? Because you are scared. You also read the same myths and false uh, things that people talk about. That is why you are scared of using high dose. High dose does not have any problems. We have studied so many of these patients. There are trials and studies. 
20 milligrams of atorvastatin has the same side effect as 80 milligrams of statin. It's a psychological block which people seem to carry, both doctors and patients, that you must not give very high dose of statins. So first of all, get rid of that block. So use high dose statins, particularly when the patient has ACS, myocardial infarction, patients had angioplasty, bypass surgery, diabetic patients, stroke patients, peripheral vascular disease patients. You've got a huge number of patients in your practice who need it. High dose. So you give the high dose instead of you getting scared and giving mid-dose. Now, again, after, suppose you give in mid-dose, your question is what to do next? Look at the LDL. I mean, look at the LDL. If it's your mid-dose, 10 milligrams of rosuvastatin, the patient's LDL is 35. You don't need to do anything else. But the question is in real life, this doesn't happen. With the 10 milligrams of rosuvastatin, most patients' LDL will remain 60, 70, 80. Yes, there'll be 10% of patients whose LDL will be very low. They're lucky patients. Give them 10 milligrams and be happy. Don't need to add anything. But when the patient's LDL is not controlled with your mid-dose, increase the dose to maximum. If the patient doesn't want to take or you don't want to give, add azetamide or bempedoic acid or both. Thanks, sir. There's a question from Dr. Sharma, endocrinologist Jaipur. He's saying that some of my insulins are now available as a tablet. Is PCS K9 going to be available as a tablet soon? Any ideas, sir, you have? Yes, there are some studies looking at oral PCSK9. They're in the Vogue, in the, in the pipeline. I read a couple of abstracts also related to that. It's not, it's far from coming into the market, but it is, yes, it's a process uh, in uh, going on. And the oral PCSK9 abstracts have been presented in ESC as early as uh, two or three years ago also. So, yes, it is possible they may come. Also, I think the very other big thing which will come is Inclisiran, which is already now FDA approved uh, in Europe. Inclisiran prevents production of PCSK9. PCSK9 inhibitor blocks PCSK9, which has already been formed. Enclisiran actually prevents the production of PCSK9. Advantage of uh, enclisiran is that you have to use it only twice a year. And because it's not a, a monoclonal antibody, it is cheaper. So enclisiran will be cheaper and twice a year. And it might completely replace everything. There's a big study going on in UK where enclisiran is available where they're studying about, I think, 30,000 people, not patients, people, and giving them inclisiran. And they're going to watch them over the next three years, five years, as to how much significant reduction of these so-called normal people will have in terms of future prevention. So we call inclisiran as a cardiovascular vaccine. So just like you get these mRNA vaccines for COVID, you'll have inclisiran vaccine, which you go to your physician, take it twice a year, or take it yourself, most of these can be taken. PCSK9, you can take yourself. It's a very easy injecting thing. That you don't need to go to a doctor for the injection. Similarly, in Clisaran, you'll be able to take yourself. So every twice a year, once on your birthday and once in between, take in Clisaran. You may not need to take any other drug. We don't know. I'm just putting forward all these things which are well into the pipeline. Thanks, doctor. A cardiologist from Rajkot wants to know, sir, that in some of my statin intolerant patients, uh, my experience with azetamide has not been very good. Am I to be worried that in such patients, even bampedoic acid may not work? Not at all. You're not, uh, it, you have no worries on that score at all. But number one, first of all, your intolerant patients for statin should not be more than 10%. If you more than 10% of your patients complain to you they're intolerant, then I think you need better communication. Sorry, please excuse me for saying that. But most, most people I've talked to, I we find that at least 95% of our patients remain on statins. It's a question of communication and explanation to the patient. If you simply listen to the patient who says, I got muscle pain, I can't tolerate, and then okay, cut down the dose, it's not going to work. Spend time with your patient, explain the importance of low LDL cholesterol. Many patients do not. Well, if, your patient, if your patient was a diabetic and his blood sugar was 300 and he came to you, would you ignore it? Would the patient ignore it? No. You, both of them will, both the patients will jump on your head and say, bring my sugar down, bring my sugar down, or I'm changing my diabetologist. But neither they are bothered about LDL, nor you are bothered, because they do not understand the significance of low LDL. So I think as doctors, we must impress upon them the reduction of LDL. Now, when you asked about bempedoic acid, because azetamide, no, azetamide, you must remember, is a weak LDL drug. It will reduce by 10, 12 milligrams, 15 milligrams. So it's not a dramatic, it won't reduce by 40, 50 milligrams. So clearly, it's a small reduction. Now, the action of azetamide is purely on the intestines, prevention of fat absorption. Bempedoic acid is a completely different mechanism, exactly like statins. So, in fact, statins and bempedoic acid have the same mechanism of action. 
And in fact, the correct question would be, should patient not responding to statin, will he respond to bepinoic acid? That would be the correct question. The statin responders, non-responders, bepinoic acid is a different pathway, azetamide is a different pathway, and both will have different forms of action. So you're worried that patient is not responding to azetamide, he will respond, he or she will respond to bepinoic acid, and I would suggest that you combine both to get both aspects of treatment in the patient. Uh, there is one personal question, Dr. Jamshed Dalal. If I may be allowed to ask, I would like to ask it. The doctor wants to know, as Dr. Jamshed Dalal, would you use bampedoic acid? Or what you are talking here is primarily because of the program which is being run on behalf of a pharmaceutical company. The question to that is very simple. I am not presenting to you anything to do with uh, this company. Bempedoic acid has been manufactured by various companies. And this is my third lecture on bempedoic acid from uh, three different companies. <clears throat> I'm not here to promote bempedoic acid. I've made it very clear. In fact, my first statement was do not replace statins with bempedoic acid. If I was promoting the drug, I would say all your patients can now be shifted to bempedoic acid. They will not complain of muscle pain. But I think at least six times I've said it so far. <clears throat> do not replace statins with bempedoic acid. Would I use bempedoic acid? If it's necessary, I would use it. My first drug at the moment would be statins. My second drug at the moment is azetamide because bempedoic acid was not available. If my patient's LDL doesn't achieve the goal, then I give them PCSK9. As I told you, I've got several dozens of patients on PCSK9. I convince them to use it even if it's expensive. I sometimes use it once a month instead of once in 15 days to cut down the cost. And I think that I'm able to convince my patients to do so. Now, since bempedoic acid is there, will I use it? Well, I would use it instead of PCSK9 for all my patients who require it. So if my patient, for example, were on statins, were on azetamide, and I was giving PCSK9 inhibitor because their LDLs had not achieved gold, I would stop the PCSK9 and give them a trial with bempedoic acid to see if I can shift them from PCSK9 to, uh, to bempedoic acid. I have many, many patients who do not take PCSK9 inhibitors because they're saying this is too expensive. In those patients also, I would definitely give bepidoic acid. If a patient doesn't tolerate azetamide for GI problems, I think azetamide is pretty tolerant drug, but in case patient doesn't tolerate it, then I would combine statins with bepidoic acid. If my patient is genuinely intolerant to statin or for some reason, personal reason, does not want to take statins, I have families who say, if you don't want to take statins, I mean, they sort of made up their mind. Somebody has convinced them that they don't. In which case, I start azetamide. And in now in this case, now in these patients, I would definitely combine azetamide and bempedoic acid. I'm not sure whether monotherapy with bempedoic acid is going to be sufficient to treat any large number of patients, unless very minimal patients who got mildly elevated lipids or who are a low-risk group of patients and who do not want to take statins. Yes, then I would use. Otherwise, even in these low-risk patients, I would give 5 milligrams of uh, rosuva statin or 10 milligrams of atorostatin as my first drug. So please, I'm not promoting bepinoic acid. It has a role to play. It is a new drug. It doesn't have any outcome studies. I've mentioned that also before. I've also mentioned uric acid problems, gout problems, and some tendon rupture problems. I've also mentioned that we don't have any long-term study data. All we have is short-term reduction of LDL, and therefore its utility in patients who are statin intolerant and in patients who's lipids remain high in spite of other drugs available today. So I hope I've answered your question. Thanks, doctor. There is a doctor physician from Coimbatore saying that many of his patients are pre-diabetic or diabetic patients. To such patients, do I have a concern in using bampedoic acid? Is it likely to deteriorate the diabetes? Bampedoic acid doesn't deteriorate diabetes from whatever studies we have now. We need to look at large outcome data as well. So right now, the studies which were done, the clear studies, don't show any rise of sugar, like statins. But again, as clearly mentioned, don't get too much caught up in this diabetes. If a patient has got vascular disease and patient has diabetes, believe me, these patients with diabetes will have myocardial infarction, stroke. 80% of my patients or 70% of my patients who I do angioplasty have diabetes. So please remember, diabetes is the cause of the problems. The drugs are not the cause of the problem. And we all know that when you use statins in diabetic patients, they do even better in terms of reduction, the relative reduction. So please do not use diabetes as an excuse for not using statin. Same way, do not use diabetes as an excuse for using bepidoic acid instead of statins. So statins remain the gold standard to be used today. 
Yes, you can add bipinoic acid, you can add azetamide, but statins remain the basic goal and you must try and keep optimizing full proper dose of maximally tolerated dose of statins as your first drug. Do not get sidetracked into using one or the other drugs instead of statins. I think I made myself very clear a number of times now. Thank you, doctor. We, we have almost 400 doctors online at the moment, sir, across the country. And maybe we have a few more questions to answer after which we will close, sir. Uh, the next question is from a physician from Guwahati. He's asking based on the diagram that you had shown that bampidoic acid and statins, they work on the same pathway. Why there is a need to add them together? Exactly. That is a question which many people have had in our previous discussion as well. That Vampidoic acid and statins are the only ones which act on the same pathway. Azetamide is a different pathway. PCSK9, different pathway. Intracerin, different pathway. So all the other three drugs are different pathways. These two are same pathway. So clearly, yes, there is a concern that they're acting on the same pathway. Should you choose two drugs acting on the same pathway? And this was a question raised at the last meeting. Would you put two beta blockers in one patient? Would you put two types of calcium channel blockers in one patient? No. Then why are you using the two drugs on the same pathway? Well, we don't want to use both the drugs in the same pathway as a first choice. We don't want to. Nobody is going to start statin and pepidoic acid at the same time. I think the correct thing to do, in my opinion, is to start statins. Then, of course, you got azetamide, which has got a different pathway. And then you got pepidoic acid, which produces the additional reduction of LDL on top of the statin, on top of the azetamide. So when you cannot achieve the goal with two separate pathways, the addition of one more pathway will improve it. So clearly, for example, if you've got a patient whose heart rate is very high and cannot tolerate one particular drug, you can add the same pathway drug, which is a little bit different in its mechanism of action, which would have additional benefit. But you're absolutely right. This is the two drugs which are the same pathway. So use drugs of different pathways first and then go back to the bempinoic acid if LDL remains high. So maybe last few questions. A doctor from Ranchi wants to know, should I use bempinoic acid upfront along with the statins or I add bampidoic acid over the course of time? I would suggest that in your routine normal patients, you should add, uh, you should start with statins only and use maximum doses of statins. When I say, when you say statins, I don't mean 5 and 10 milligrams. I mean at least minimum 20 milligrams of rosuva statin in a stable patient and 40 milligrams of rosuva statin in an ACS patient. Similarly, with atorvastatin, 40 milligrams of atorvastatin routinely and 80 milligrams in an ACS patient. So that would be my dose of statins. If after that the LDL is low, you can add azetamide or bempoic acid. There's also another theory. I don't want to go into that because it might cause confusion. In what is called as a very high intensity therapy when patients come with ACS. That means you put them on maximum doses of everything, including PCSK9, and then you de-escalate the therapy because the maximum period of problems after ACS is the first few weeks. So there's one aspect of treatment. It's like treatment of heart failure. You put all the drugs in the beginning and then adjust the doses accordingly afterwards. But clearly that's not the thing which is expected or easy to follow because of PCSK9 being expensive. But for example, if your patient comes with ACS and has got multiple problems, polyvascular disease, his LDL is in the range of 150, 170. You could add all the three drugs, statins, azetamide, and bapoidic acid at the same time. When the patient comes for follow-up, you measure the LDL. If the LDL is 45, 50, you continue all the drugs. If the LDL has come to 20, you may decide to stop one of the drugs. So clearly, you can adjust the drugs depending on your LDL response uh, to the treatment. So one of the questions our doctor is inquiring, <laughs> It's a little commercial question. I don't know whether you'll be the right person to answer. Uh, while I have heard of Crestor from AstraZeneca, Lipitor from Pfizer, I have not heard of any innovator company for bampidoic acid. There is no GSK, there is no Merv, there is no Pfizer, there is no Lily. Why is that, sir? You answered that question. I don't know why there is and why, 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 the, uh, why has it become generic right from the beginning? It's an interesting question, but I have no answer as to why no original company is there. Can you answer it? You probably know. Sir, to all my participating doctors, uh, since I represent pharmaceutical company, I would prefer all questions and answers to be answered by our eminent speaker, Jamshed Dalal, and I would prefer not to get into any commercial discussions in this scientific meeting. We go to the next question, sir, and probably the last one or two questions more. Is bampidoic acids 
use only restricted to AS CBD patients or some patients who have stelled alone high levels of LDL? Of course, I mean, like, I, I think I've not made myself clear, obviously. We don't, if a patient has high LDL, we do not wait for patient to get a myocardial infarction. We don't wait for patient to get a stroke. We don't wait for patient to get peripheral artery disease and then start treatment. The whole concept of primary prevention, I mean, primary prevention has been talked about for the last 30 years. Jupiter trial, all the other trials, the forest trial, they were all primary prevention. LDL must be reduced. LDL must be reduced as early as possible in life which is why we suggest that all children should have one lipid profile done. The reason for doing that is that many of these patients have got uh, heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. Well, the LDL will be high, not homozygous, where it's very low and they die within the first uh, 20 years. But these patients with very high LDL cholesterol should be picked up and detected before they have car cardiovascular or any vascular disease. And they should be treated. The whole concept of primary treatment, Jupiter trial, use of statins for primary treatment. So clearly, you do not wait for ASCVD to develop. You need to prevent it. You are a doctor. You must prevent disease, not treat only disease after it comes. I hope you are doing LDL measurements in all your patients. And all the patients whose LDL are more than 100 or 110, you start treating them first with lifestyle and then with small doses of drugs if they are primary prevention. I'm not saying under any circumstances that patients with primary prevention should be put on maximum doses of statins or should be given combinations of statins plus azetamide and bipred. Absolutely no. They should be put on modest doses of, uh, of uh, cholesterol loading. If you remember HOPE 3 trial, which looked at Rosua statin for primary prevention, 10 milligrams. Jupiter trial had used 20 milligrams. But clearly, I think you have to understand that patients with high LDL or patients with very high HSCRP need to be treated with statins to reduce the LDL. Please do not wait for ASCVD to occur before you treat the patients. All diabetic patients should be on statin to reduce their LDL. They don't necessarily need to have a uh, vascular problem. All diabetic patients uh, beyond a certain time need to be on statins. I think I put all my diabetic patients, as soon as diabetes treatment starts, they are on statins. Not aspirin. Many people use aspirin very randomly without thinking. Aspirin is harmful. It produces bleeding. Statins are safe. So when you want to prevent problems in patients with diabetes, use statins, not aspirin. Aspirin has its own indications. I won't get into that. But statin is a good drug to young. Lipid loading is extremely important. I think please go away with this whole one hour. If it's spent on anything, it is please keep your LDL cholesterol low. Thank you so much, sir, for all the questions being answered. Finally, sir, I would request you to summarize all your points into major four or five takeaways which you would like 400 doctors which are currently running on this uh, scientific seminar on bampedoic acid to be taking home the message with them. So my number one point would be that uh, ASCVD is extremely common in our country. Diabetes and hypertension are extremely common in our country. Measure the lipid profile of everybody at an early age. Patients who get admitted to the hospital or come to your clinic and ask for a blood test, please do lipid profiles for all these patients. Fasting lipid profile is not necessary. You can do a non-fasting lipid profile. Get the LDL down. I showed you the charts and various guidelines. Follow the guidelines. Look at the Lipid Association of India guidelines and follow them depending on whether the patient is low risk, high risk or extremely high risk. Follow the guidelines. The first drug of choice should always be statins. Try and convince the patient that statins doesn't produce as much problems as they think. It's a fairly safe drug. Also, get into your mind and the patient's mind that low LDL is not harmful. I showed you data as well. LDL as low as 20 is not harmful. So when you see an LDL of 30, don't panic and start cutting down drugs. Number three, statin is the first drug of choice. If cholesterol LDL levels remain high as per the guidelines, add azetamide. This is what we used to do till now. If bepinoic acid is available, you can add azetamide or bepinoic acid. Azetamide is a different pathway. Bepinoic acid is the same pathway. You can combine azetamide with bepinoic acid and uh, uh, statins to get to achieve the goals. If in spite of all these goals are not achieved, use PCSK9. But important thing and most important, keep your LDL as low as possible for as long as possible. The more cardiovascular and peripheral vascular and polyvascular disease, the more important is to keep your LDL low. Don't think of low LDL as 60 and 70. Think of low LDL between 40 and 50. Over to Ajay Chauhan, sales head of our company. 
Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, very good evening to all. I'm Ajay Chauhan. I'm sales head, taking care of North and East business. Sir, uh, very good evening to all. I thank you very much, Dr. Dalal, for a wonderful deliberation of on a relatively very new topic. Sir, with this, we come to an end of a fantastic scientific event. And I would like to thank all the viewers who have joined, who have joined us live from different part of the country. Sir, in, to put it in the numbers, we, are, we have 400 plus uh, doctors, live participants, and I'm sure all those viewers have, fi have found this event very, very uh, worth spending their uh, very precious time. Sir, once again, I would like to thank Dr. Jal Dr. Dalal. Thank you all the viewers for making this event a grand success. Thank you once again. Have a very good day ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Dalal. Thank, Thank you so much, sir. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.